from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the WOW Report. Um, we're counting down the top 10 things this past week that made us go wow. wow. Um, I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder. I'm in London, as is Tom Campbell, our chief creative officer. Hi, Tom. Hello, Fenton. Hello, James. I'm good, thank you. And James St. James, uh, editor of the WOW Report. I'm in the sensation. This is, I'm in Dubrovnik. This is just a green screen of my bookcases behind me. Well, if you're in Dubrovnik, why are you complaining about the time of day? Because you're actually ahead of us then, in that case. The, gotcha. the, the, our listeners don't know that I've been complaining about the time of day. They keep it between ourselves, not in front of the audience. And said, quite... Please, please. <laughs> All right. So let's start counting down the top 10 things this week that made us go, wow, wow. number 10, Tom. Number 10. I don't watch 60 Minutes every week. Uh, I caught it on YouTube. It had two powerhouse pieces this week. And the first one I want to talk about is Tony Bennett. Anderson Cooper did a piece on Tony Bennett, his last act. And, you know, Tony Bennett is just perennial, right? He's been around forever. I think he's deep in his 90s. And 95, 95 or, yeah, I think it was 95th birthday. Is. You know, and he did the Lady Gaga album a while ago, duets, and there's a um, Radio City Music Hall. He did two albums with Lady Gaga, and the second one, it, you'll, you'll talk about what happened during the second one. Yes, but and there's this Radio City Music Hall special that's coming out, and I, I knew all of this are on the back burner, but what I did not know what this piece revealed in the most heartbreaking, beautiful, warm way is that uh, Tony Bennett is suffering from Alzheimer's, from dementia. And he doesn't necessarily, you know, he has good moments and bad moments. He starts off strong. His wife, Mrs. Benedetto, because that's his real last name, um, is is younger and takes care of him. And but, They've been um, together 30 years, though, which is really quite beautiful. She yes. looks like she's a trophy wife, but she isn't. She's really been by his side the entire time. She's yes. a wonderful, wonderful woman. And yes. this piece really showed that. And um, what it really revealed to me is he, you know, Lady Gaga was also interviewed and they show a piece of their performance. And, you know, Lady Gaga is very aware that he hasn't said her name for, for the last, you know, few times they've been together that he just doesn't really, he doesn't think he, she doesn't think he recognizes her, which he probably does not. And she tries to keep her questioning very simple, like, Hey, you know, let's sing love for sale. And he'll say yes. But if she gives him a choice, he doesn't know what to do. So she's just trying to manage the situation the best she can. Um, what happens when the curtain parts and the audience is there applauding and the music starts is that he comes alive. Tony Bennett is back and in the room. The lights come back on. And I, I've heard research. I went to a panel years ago with my friend Elena, and they say that music stores in your brain in a very in multiple places in your brain. I'm not a scientist, clearly. And that you know, they even say for Alzheimer's patients at old age, age homes, they'll go and sing songs from their youth and they all sing along. They all know the lyrics. It all brings them, you know, to some extent back to life, back to what they remember when they don't remember who they are, what they had for breakfast or who their, you know, daughter is. And that's what happened to Tony Bennett on stage. And then there's this little moment that makes you cry. And James will talk about it where he, he goes, ladies, you know, she comes out, starts to sing and he goes, Lady Gaga. And in that moment, she realized, oh, my God, in this moment, he remembers me. And she goes, just for that brief moment for that flick, her friend was there and he remembered her. And um, I'm not doing the piece justice, but it's such a beautifully told story. Tony Bennett's an amazing artist. By the way, when he's singing, they said he had a few little flubs there. He's, his voice is still so rich, so beautiful. I, I was able to see him maybe three Christmases ago at the Stevie Wonder Christmas concert. And, you know, he sang Left My Heart in San Francisco and Melted uh, a Stadium. So... Um, I went on and on. I think you did no, great justice to it. It, it was a couple of moments that, that really stuck out for me was, you know, the, the beauty of his, his wife and how, how she guides him through every day. And she says that sometimes he's better and sometimes he's worse. And the way she, she sort of coaxes, you know, Tony out from the shell is really beautiful. And she says that he doesn't know that he has Alzheimer's, which is very, which is, is shot that he just is, 
in his little fog and he comes out of it every once in a while and he's Tony. But when he's in the fog, he doesn't realize that he's that he's well, suffering. That's which is really interesting because Carrie Fisher said, you know, the, the great thing about losing your mind is is when you lose your mind, you don't know that you've lost you know, it. Yeah, you don't You're know. Fine. It's, it's not, <laughs> it, he's not suffering and right. he's in his beautiful home. He's got beautiful his beautiful wife and caretakers and the the piano man who comes by and his his assistant or whatever and they play songs and those for those for that hour he was playing he was rehearsing and he was it was just the music is there and it's still trapped inside of him and it can come out at a drop of a hat and he's tony again and it was it was really beautiful to watch that the other thing that happened on 60 minutes though go tom because that we're going to talk about that later or do we want to talk about it now i think that's our our number one that's 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 a what's that call a deep tease james well done the deep tease we're coming back to what else happened on 60 minutes all right uh, you can watch that video about Tony Bennett on the WOW Report. And now we're going to go on to number nine, James. Number nine. Number nine, Squid Game. It's the biggest TV show in the history of the planet. It is number one in 69 different, 169 different countries. It is a powerhouse. People are going bananas over this shit. What happened? You players go to a fish market, they buy three squid, and they throw it up in the air, and the first person to catch it wins. No, that's not true at all. That, that's not, <laughs> I'm, I'm fucking, I'm playing with you. I this love that. It. What this you had is, me, James. You had me. <laughs> this is, it's a dystopian uh, uh, mind game. Uh, it's sort of, it's uh, Willy Wonka meets Battle Royale, meets The Hunger Games, meets Jigsaw, meets uh, Escape Room, meets um, The Most Dangerous Game. It's, there's this mysterious benefactor. This max mask man, and he uh, finds these people who are down on their luck, who are gamblers, who are in debt, who are deeply in debt, and they're sort of life's losers. And he, they receive a car, a business card, and mysteriously receive a business card with a phone number on it. And if they call the number, it says, "Do you want to play the game?" And if they say yes, they are met at a certain destination. They are gassed with knockout gas and they wake up in this bunker filled with hundreds of people all given numbers and there are these creepy men wandering around and i'm sure you've seen this in the meme in pink hoods bright pink hoods with face masks on and each face mask has either a triangle a square or a circle on it and that designates whether they're soldiers or they are managers or they are workers whatever but so there are these creepy men sort of running the game and they're all masks and they play a series of six children's games that everybody knows that have been modified. And the first one is green light, red light. Remember that as a child where green light and everybody runs red light and you stop and you freeze. And there's a voice that comes over this perky little voice saying, we're going to play a game and we're playing green light, red light. And when it goes green light, you run and red light, you stop and freeze. Do not move. If you move, you are eliminated. And nobody really knows what that means. So there's 240 people playing this game. And when it stops, green, red light, everybody stops. And some people were sort of wobbling and they were immediately shot. Like in the face. Like, blah, blah, and the face blows off. And all of a sudden, you realize that if you are eliminated, you die. And the soldiers come, and the pink hoods come out and shoot you in the face. And literally... 200 people are shot in the face in the first episode, and it is the most beautiful cinematic gore you have ever seen. It makes Tarantino look like a hack. It is so beautifully done. The, the way it is like a ballet with people being shot and killed. 200 people you watch. James, why? Why? Because what well, is that's the game. There is a giant bowl over the, the bunkers. And every time a person dies, more money falls into the bowl. And it keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And so every time someone dies, you, it goes from 6 million to 10 million to 20 million. Okay. So the next game, there's like a series of six games. And there's it's, they're simple. It's like marbles. But it, the stakes keep getting higher and higher and higher. And the idea is to try and have your opponent, you, you know, have your partner killed or whatever. And by the time there's this other, there's one called the glass bridge, which is like hopscotch. And this one is just, I'm sorry, we can cut this for time. I don't know, but I have to sort of explain this oh. one to you. This is the most 
terrifying game. They're high, high up on two different um, platforms, and there's a glass bridge going across them, and it's two panels each of glass, and one of them will hold a person, and one of them will not, and so it's like you have to jump from to the one of the two panels each time. There's 15 of them, 15 groups of two going across, and so they're in a line. By this time, there's 16 people, and there are 16 of them, 16 of them, and so the first person has to decide which of the two panels to jump on, and he never makes it. He never does it. But if he doesn't do it, then the person behind him has the panel of it, you know, knows which panel to go to. So but as it goes across, the person in front has a one in 33 million chances of getting it right, whereas the person in back has like a one in two chances of getting it right. You know, it's just, the, yeah. I have to ask. They don't really get shot in the face and die. They really get shot in the face. And they when they fall to their death, you see them fall. It's just like, it's like. It's rag like the floor and, is down. Down. and they're doing a performance as they're going down. Is that what I'm getting? They get, they get it, paintballed. It's, it's no, well, no, it's it, no, just, just a bullet in the face. It's, but it's, it's so, it's, so it's, by the no, end. It's scripted. It's not reality. No, 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 no. But unfortunately, show. what I worry about happening is that, like, after Fight Club came out, and all of a sudden there were Fight Clubs all over the world, and after the Joker came out, and everyone started dressing like the Joker and I, doing violence, I, just, I worry that people are going to actually start playing. I thought this games. was a game show. Game show. I didn't know it was a scripted no. drama about a it game is, show. Yes, it's, a scripted, it's it's you know the dystopian oh. reality show movie type. But James, the thing I the I just don't get it. Like, look, did you watch why it? Why would anyone watch it? Because it, when I tell you that the tension and the terror keeps, keeps like mounting it. and mounting and mounting, and each game gets progressively t more and more. Because by the time it it keeps winnowing down, so that by like the third game, there's like twenty people playing, mm -hmm. and then the fourth game, there's fifteen people playing mm -hmm. like that. So by the time it ends up with just two people that you have love and you care for and you want, to, and they are pitted against each other in the Squid Game, yeah. Blake says we have to move on, but I have friends who work at Netflix, and I happen to know, spoiler alert, that the last two people lip sync for their life. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to just say that you have a choice between watching it dubbed or watching it in sub with subtitles, and the dubbing is very much, you, my good sir, I beg of you, please so do not subtitles. die. What? Subtitles. No, the I'm not going to watch it in any iteration. I preferred yeah. your description of three people going to the market and throwing a squid in the air, <laughs> and that's the end of the show. And we watch, we tune in next week to see the same thing. That's what I like. I like low stakes, low energy, no jeopardy, no violence, just love and squid. I I'm mean, why is it called Squid Game? Why it sounds it? good to me, James. It's really fantastic. And but like I said, watch it in the subtitles, though. It's called Squid Game because at the very end, there's a Korean childhood game called the Squid Game. And it's a, you're, uh, it's like a hopscotch, but it's shaped like a squid. And you have to stay within the borders of the squid. I think it's sick and wrong, and I thoroughly disapprove. And it's streaming on Netflix. But you loved Hunger Games. But it wasn't violent. It like, was. It was children killing each other. But not in a very, like, shoot in the face, lots of gore everywhere. But you know? I'm telling you, this is the most beautiful gore you will ever <sighs> see. Number eight. Number eight. Speaking of gore, going off, Diana the Musical. So oh, we all know wow. what happened to Diana. She died in a car crash. And now they've turned it into a musical. Um, it was going to uh, debut on Broadway just before the pandemic. Um, got shut down. I think it made it into a couple of previews. And then those crafty people at Netflix came in and filmed it during lockdown. And it is probably the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It is. But I hear that Cats is now a work of genius. I was going to say, I hear that it's Showgirls. It is so bad that it is the new Rocky Horror. Showgirls is a work of genius. Showgirls is really good. This is genuinely awful. For a start, it's a very pedestrian filming of a proscenium arch musical, number one. Number two, the musical itself is so old-fashioned. It's just so bizarre that it's just like sort of, it's almost like a time capsule that they went back 50, 60 years, whenever musicals were at their peak and did a not very good one with Diana. And 
the queen comes on and we are in crisis. It's just so awful. It is so awful. Um, some of the lyrics. So Diana is chased by paparazzi, as you know, chased to her death. But in her first encounter with the paparazzi there, they're all in those Max and the pork pie hats and they're taking flash pictures. Like, again, like out of some noir film of the 1940s. It's like, and they're singing better than a Guinness, better than a wank. Snap a few pics. It's money in the bank. Come on. <laughs> um, Perfect oh, rhyme. Yes, so I'll give that. Wank, bank. Right. Wank and bank. Uh, the first um, date they go on, um, Prince Charles thinks he's going to see Duran, Duran, Duran. <laughs> but there's only two, Duran, Duran. But it, it, actually, they go to a cello recital. And Lady Di is very bored. And she says, sings, I should say, nights like this, I envy the poor. Their parties can't possibly be such a bore. <laughs> and then the, she's talking about the Russian cellist. She's like, the Russian plays on and on like an endless telethon. How I <laughs> wish you were Elton John. I mean, Jesus Christ, this is sort of thing probably, that Madonna would write. I, I It's just so awful. Well, now you've gone too far. But I do <laughs> want to say that I hear that people are having Princess Diana uh, parties and no, sing, doing That's what the reviews say people will do. But you no, know, no, I've, I've heard that the, 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 the gays, that the gays are having viewing parties. Honey, the, the gays are not watching Cats and the gays are not going to be going to. That they're have... having like Sound of Music sing-alongs sing because it's so music, bad. It is, it's it's so Camp. Camp. Yes, it is. It's it's absolute camp, and that people have recognized that and are watching it in droves. No, this is it's this number hear, one in 169 countries. I hear that Princess <laughs> Diana's big number is called underestimated, which is just oh, is the yes. worst the big number is I'm underestimated. Saying. It's terrible, and there's the all the all the servants are singing uh, the worst job in England because they want Di to be the princess, and it's the worst job in England, and um. I, 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 and you know what? At the end of it, you know, I'm I'm hanging in there because I think there's going to be a great car crash sequence. No, they skip. I'm uh, they skip the whole car crash. Yes, she dies, of course, because you know it's based on truth. But you know what I'm asking is where's where's the dancing tampax? That's what you need. You need a chorus of tampons oh. coming out. Well, that's for the know, Camilla the, musical, which is coming next season. What is that? I said that's Camilla. for the Camilla musical, which is oh, coming next go. season. Okay. Oh, and the Camilla. Oh, anyway. Um, so that's two awful things you don't want to watch on Netflix. No, Squid Game no. and another musical. How dare you? I'm telling you, <laughs> Squid Game is brilliant. <laughs> Let's take a break, Blake. Ask us something, please. <laughs> okay. Well, this one's a doozy. Which pop star says she was attacked by wild boars in Barcelona this week. We all have the answer for you here on the WOW Report right after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders WOW Report. Things that make us go wow. Hey, welcome back to the WOW Report. Um, I just got to tell you that Rue's brand new album, I think it's his 14th or is it his 17th? It's a significant number is called Mama Roo, and it's available for pre-order today. Oh, I've got a question about another pop star. Which pop star says she was attacked by wild boars in Barcelona this week? This attention-seeking pop star can only be... Taylor Swift. Madonna. Oh. <laughs> no, it was Shakira. Oh. Oh. Shakira, they snatched our purse and destroyed everything. I hate you when know boars Europe has snatched... Europe Europe has like a problem right now with wild boars running around, I guess. Was she in the forest or where? Where was she? I don't think so. I think she was just at a cafe. <laughs> it sounds like a sexy themed party at the Eagle to me. Wild boar. <laughs> I remember there was a wild boar problem here in Texas a while back. Yeah, and they, they were ate someone, and... didn't they? Yeah, and they were they would chase people down the street, and they would you know come over, go over mm. fences, and they're 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 crafty little devils. Could this I be a real problem? Is, I believe James has been referred to as a wild boar a few times. <laughs> oh, you don't want to start this early. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's carry on with our countdown of the top ten things this week that made us go wow. Number seven. Number seven. Speaking of being a bore, 
I've, you know, been a little busy working. I've been in a different time zone. I'm trying to suck up the pop culture. But you know what I do every day, and we have never talked about it? You're Not a blue sense. Um, The spelling bee puzzle in the New York Times. I've got the app. It is a word find. You guys are aware of it? You guys know about it? No. <gasps> If you go to the crossword pe page online, you just scroll down and it's a big yellow bumblebee, you can't miss it. And it's like honeycomb. So it's one letter, one letter, one letter, six letters surrounding a, a center letter. And you have to get as many words as possible. All the words have to be at least four letters long and have to include at least one of the middle letter. And they'll tell you how you can get up to genius and they'll tell you like 151 or 72 or 35 if it's really hard. And so you just go and go for it. But, and I've never done this to tell you the truth, but my friend Johnny has, my sister Amy has, it's very addictive. If you get every word that could possibly be made from these, this combination of letters using the middle letter, you get um, queen B and you get this big, uh, like, like almost like a Ru Peter badge of a B and, and it's, it is the best bragging rights right now among my my friends. And they send wait, it to an actual post, then, bee they? Or you actually a get a physical bee. thing. No. Well, okay, hold on. What? Wait, one of us say it because we both asked the same question at the same time. So, Fenton, ask. I, I'm talking too much. You go, James. Is this an actual bee or is it a virtual bee? It's a virtual bee. But okay. I'm just saying when, when you get queen bee and you get that little screen, people screen grab it, put up, it's like everyone congratulates them. Because as you can imagine, there's just words you don't know. There's just words you don't. And you learn not. Did you know that non-nillion is a word that comes in a lot? Non-nillion, non-nillion. It's, um, it's replaced my, uh, my, my, my uh, ebb and flow obsession with crosswords. I just love it. My sister and I, if we hit genius, we send the word that we got genius with a little B in our texts. I just find it, I don't know, I need something to keep me company in the middle of the day and in between things. Yes, James. Now, two things. Number one, I, I think this sort of ties into your first one where it's one of those wonderful ways to stave off dementia and it keeps your mind agile and, and people so. go bananas for that. But I would think that it'd be very easy just to type into Google how many how many words can you make out of these four letters and you would get 172. You don't want to do that. That's no fun. No? Okay. We well, do it that I, I, I cheat at crosswords too, so. And the big fun thing to do is when you really have gotten it, if you get the panogram, which means you used every letter in the in the wheelhouse, sometimes more. And it's just funny because my sister tends to find the little letters and ends with the big, the big words. And I'm like always big picture, like I figure out the anagram and then I'm like chopping away at the rest. I know it's silly, but until you, don't knock it until you tried it. Have you I tried this game, Wordscapes? You can, it's an app and it's so similar. You get a wheel of letters, right? And then you have to like fill in all the different words that you can possibly That's do. That's the one I played. And I was thinking of this whenever you were explaining this, Tom. Yeah, well, I wonder, like, you know, like with crossword puzzles and the people who make crossword puzzles are considered, you know, just the most intelligent, the most fat. It's one of the most the hardest jobs on the planet to create crossword puzzles. I wonder how hard it is to create this every week or every day. I wonder what, who the person know. is who makes it. I'm sort of fascinated. I'd like to see a it's documentary. Like Sam Zersky or something. I'll look it up. But it's um, but it's the same guy. But it is, and you know, and and the big thing is when you find a word and it's not in there, and they're like, "Oh, you can complain," but they're always like, "Oops, sorry." But they have this little like like you know complaint box if you think you this you missed this word, um, <laughs> so they let you vent, and then they just pay no attention to you, which is good. But I'm trying to find ways to amuse myself digitally and otherwise to stay off of social media platforms, which might lead us to our number one, but I'm, I'm, it's called a deep tease. It's called a deep tease. I can see a version of this, Tom, where you win the genius B and someone comes and shoots you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Fenton, how we tie things together, don't we? No, it's a work of I genius. have two words for you if you want to keep yourself digitally amused. Pornhub. <laughs> That's something right. else. Well, okay. 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 Uh, we'll post a link to that on the Wow Report. Number six, James. Number six. Uh, a new season of Saturday Night Live started this week. And I don't know if you recall, but last May, when it was the last episode of last season, 
we all got together and we were very worried that about half the cast was planning on leaving. There had been rumors that each and every one of those people were moving on to a bigger career, to a movie career. I am happy to report that everyone returned except for one person. Returning, we have A.D. Bryant, Michael Che, Pete Davidson, Colin Jost, Cecily Strong, Kate McKinnon, who we thought for sure was a goner, uh, Mikey Day, and Keenan Thompson, who already has another series. The one who left was Beck Bennett, who I love more than I love life. Too. Oh, he's such a cutie. He is when he does his Vladimir Putin with that little dad bod of his. He is so hot. I love him so. So all the best. It was very sad not to have Beck Bennett in the lineup. You know why did he leave? I think he has a a, a movie career ahead of him. Is what I suspect. Yeah. Um, there are two, three new people. There is um, a guy named Aristotle Athen who uh, looks possibly gay i don't know he maybe has gay face maybe i'm just throwing that out there but he's really cute and he has potential to be sort of a um a hot gay icon perhaps i don't know is that the guy that was biden no no that that's that's what i'm going to talk about next the next is a guy named james austin johnson who is famous online for doing trump impressions and they recruited him and he opened the show in the cold open sketch uh doing biden which they've you know they've had a terrible luck with their bidens jim carrey was a fizzle i mean everybody they've tried to do it isn't very good this guy was really fantastic and the fact that they gave a newbie on his first episode, the, the lead in the cold open shows they have a lot of faith in this guy. Mm -hmm. They are putting all their eggs in James Austin Johnson is his name. And there's another girl named Sarah Sherman. Um, uh, Casey Musgroves was the uh, singer and I don't, everyone goes bananas for Casey. I don't know that I quite get it. She's a, a millennial, not even millennial. She's a, a generation Z thing, I think. <laughs> but she did perform naked on the air, wearing just a pair of cowboy boots and a, a guitar wow. over her nether regions. Come on. And, what and about she's saying, boobies? well, the guitar sort of went over he's, everything. And she was a sitting petite, on a stool. Yeah, she was sitting on a stool, so everything was sort of like smushed together. A couple. Yes, we had Casey Musgraves on RuPaul's Drag Race as a judge, and she wore the biggest Loretta Lynn like wig I'd ever seen. And if I, I may not be exaggerating, I think she's worn the biggest wig on the judges panel, even bigger than Ru. And I tip my bald head to Casey Musgraves; she does no wrong just by the wig size, the volume alone. Well, it, I, I, I guess I'm a new fan. I, I like, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the whole episode. I love Saturday Night Live. Even a bad Saturday Night Live, I'm there for. I enjoy. It. I think Michael Che and Colin Jost are hysterical together. I love me some Michael Che. I, I would just be spit. It's just. It? it is funny how in this crazy television world that that show somehow has more importance or is kind of a touchstone. For, yeah. for the weekend. And I keep reading that their ratings are down, but I have to imagine, because I watch most of it on YouTube, to be honest, it just depends. But like, I, I would imagine that just the, the, the digital engagement must be here. Yeah. So I hope well, they continue. Well, when they're on fire, they're on fire. There's just no doubt about it. I mean, there are always some, some bum sketches here and there, but I just, I, I it's my happy hour. My I mean, happy it sounds hour like now. Weekend Update is the sort of the go-to, the rock-solid segment that holds it always together. Yeah, which yeah. The like perfect I... segue, which is why I mention it, oh. because it's news anchors. So number five. Number five. Katie Couric. Oh, going there. My. Going there is the title yeah. of Katie Couric's wow. new book. Well, I, when I say new book, I think it might be her first book. It's a memoir. And people are not happy about it it's coming out later this month um i suppose the expectation was that it was all going to be sweetness and light it was going to be like katie Couric, as we remember her on the breakfast shows but she is settling scores um i just have to say i've worked with katie Couric. uh we did a film uh gender revolution for nat geo uh, a couple of years ago and um I can confirm that Katie in person is not the same person who reads the news. Um, you know, but but actually, I, the weird thing about Katie is, you know, she does have, you know, she has good days and bad days and she loses her temper like we all do. 
But when she does lose her temper, and this is part of my theory, she's really, even though she's shouting at you, I mean, once she was telling me to grow some balls, I just couldn't, it wasn't that I wouldn't take it seriously, but it was hard to be terrified because she just seems so nice, you know, that, that, that sort of America's sweetheart thing. And that's my theory, because where you and I and James, we can all be sort of rage filled, rage filled husks. You know, she can't be that. She's trapped in this nice body. And even when she's really angry, she doesn't seem that way at all. And when she's shouting at you, you know. So I think that would make think, you upset. If you I if you Katie, couldn't be taken seriously in your rage, that would make you that would piss you off, right? That's my theory. About I understand. Her. I completely understand not being taken seriously in my rage. But <laughs> That when I you think, bark at me, I'm terrified. I literally pee my pants when you call and yell at me, and you go rah, 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 and then slam I down the call and yell at you. We're on the air, darling. It's all <laughs> sweetness and light. At the risk of ruining your relationship with Katie Couric, I think her book should be called "See You Next Tuesday: How to Destroy Your Reputation in One Book." Because even I've not read the book, and even if it's if it's done tongue in cheek, or she thought, "Oh, I'm just going to be sassy and saucy," it's going to be. It has been torn apart before it's even been published. It has. And she puts down women and she puts, and she said, she tells, you know, Les Moonves has bad breath. She puts down Deborah Norville. She put, you know, it's, it's tone deaf. It, it does it, seem it is, that way. It seems like, and she's she not. Said, a, she writes that Matt Lauer could charm the pants off anyone. <laughs> and it's like, but she well, comes across as like. A woman who made a lot of money, who's very, you know, a leader of her field and one of the best morning anchors ever, who is taking pot shots and pissing on people that she sort of climbed over on her way up. But I have a feeling the theory behind it was it's a tougher, you know, uh, audience out there and people are want this type of thing. And so this is the way to stay relevant. This is the way to get back in the game is you're well, going to come back and you're going to be, a, you know, Tough as nails. Right. I was thinking it's like, you know, I, I think celebrities often go through a phase where they need to kill off the old version. Like I yes. was thinking of um, um, num, 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 Bowie had to kill off Ziggy Stardust or yes. um, Paul Rubens had to kill off Pee Wee Harmon. You know, Madonna um, had to chop off her hair and get rid of the boy toy image and go streamline. I, Nate you know, O'Connor had to rip the Pope in half. This is career ending for Katie Kirk. There he said it. But we do, you know, every five years you have to reinvent yourself and reintroduce yourself to a new generation of people. And this okay, generation is... Okay. All right, I can tell you one thing. I'm going to buy the book. And not only that, I'm going to buy the audio version of the book because I want to hear her reading it. Blake mentions that Rosie O'Donnell is somebody who has had multiple different, you know, lifetimes in her career. Right. Right. Well, to be continued, well, I guess, because the Ellen, book is Ellen published... DeGeneres. The book is published October 26, right? Let's well, go to the break. Was I talking over someone? What was that? What happened? There's a okay. momentary pause. No, no, Fenton. No, please don't hurt us, Fenton. You were fine. You were wonderful. We love you. Yes, Fenton. Yes, Fenton. Don't worry about James, it. Thank James, grow some balls. All right, we're going to take a break. Blake, have you got a question for us? I do. It was in the news this week. Um, apparently, the Secret Service has, we found out the the name that they gave to Melania. Oh, yeah. her, her nickname. Do you know, can you guess it? All righty. We'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. Um, Canada's Drag Race Season 2 coming next Thursday. That's October 14th to Wow Presents Plus. Wow. Worldwide, excluding Canada. Uh, it's going to be on Crave in Canada. So, Mark, it's a really good season. Um, Blake, you had a question? Yeah, you know how the Secret Service will give um, presidents and first ladies nicknames? Secret well, we code found- names. Yeah, well, we just found out what Melania's apparently was from the Secret Service during the last presidency. Can you guess what it was? I know what it was, so I'm going to let Tom guess. I'm going to guess it was Asp or uh, uh, Boris and Natasha. Natasha. Uh, I, Fenton? Cunt. What else can you call her? <laughs> I, I believe it was Rapunzel because she never came out of her tower. That's it. 
Yeah. In yeah. fact, uh, Secret Service men wanted to be on her detail because they got more time at home. Because, she <laughs> because they left. didn't have to do shit. They could just sit and read magazines all day. But they couldn't go to the bathroom, could they? They weren't allowed to use the bathroom in the White House. Well, I remember there's a funny story about Jackie O or Jackie Kennedy and how she was, you know, such a prim and proper little lady that the Secret Service have to stand outside the bathroom as you go. And so she was like, she said she couldn't poop for four years or for three years or however long because they would hear her bathroom sounds is what she called them. And she was so mortified that there was somebody standing right outside the toilet door listening to her fart. And she was just, so it was like <laughs> trauma for her. Couldn't she run upstairs and go upstairs? No, no, because they follow you wherever you are in the house. Oh, lifestyles of the rich and famous. Um, number four, we're counting down top 10 things that made us go wow. Number four. Number four. This might be a couple of things. One, the older you get, the more the past looks warm and fuzzy and, and, and lovely, right? Things that you used to make fun of suddenly you have room for. And also this COVID and this, uh, this, this lack of seeing things live that I'm actually read this online and I'm looking forward to attending the Mixtape Tour 2022, headlined by New Kids on the Block, never my favorite, but going out with in Vogue, Salt and Peppa, and hold on, Rick Astley. Who wants oh. to come? Doesn't that sound fun? It does sound fun. <laughs> Where's it going to be? It's touring all over uh, America. It's going to be in LA, and, and I, I'm going to probably get tickets. It just, I don't know. New Kids on the Block, the only song I know is the oh, 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 oh. oh. <laughs> which I love it's and, and all the new kids in the block look pretty good. They've kind they of do. like, gotten through, they've gotten through COVID like in shape. They look kind of cute and they have to have a lot of hair and stuff. Well, there's two of them that have gotten actually better looking than they were 30 years ago. The lead singer, Jordan, I think. And there's yep. a, the little one, the little one is just, I mean, one of the Joey handsomest guys. I believe is his name. Yes. I'm way too old for boy bands. I wasn't totally into them. You couldn't, you, you couldn't escape them when they were famous, but I wasn't focusing on them. But I think I'm going to be a, a, a new kids on the blocker. What 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 are they? Are they butterflies? Who are what? What do you call a new kid in the block fan? I guess you call it a blockhead. Hey, I'm a blockhead. <laughs> oh, even it's the three of them. Even yeah, I want them to sing, and I saw Pepper is amazing, and Rick Astley can still ah. sing. I saw a videotape of him, a YouTube clip of him singing uh, with Kylie Minogue not that long ago. So I, I think we should all go. We should just put on our '80s clothes and, and have a blast. I love it. I love it. Tickets are on sale. Blake, where are the tickets on sale? Um, oh, has it not been announced just yet? It, go find the tickets on the internet. All right. Yeah, number three. Number three. I watched both Venoms this week. I watched the 2018 uh, movie with Tom Hardy, the Marvel superhero Venom. And um, I, it was like 11 o'clock at night. I was just about to go to bed and I was scrolling through one last time and I saw it had just started and I thought, oh, I'll watch 20 minutes. And then after 20 minutes, I said, I'll watch another 20 minutes. And then all of a sudden it's like two o'clock in the morning and I'm just like still venoming. Like it is, I, it, I was absolutely enthralled. And so I got off my ass and went to the movie theater on, on Monday, yesterday or the other day, I went to the movie theater and watched Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage. And I, you know, I always rail against Marvel, blah, blah, blah. I had more fun with these movies than I've had in years. It was up there with Deadpool is my favorite Marvel character. Tom Hardy, who is just adorable. He's just so cute. He has an alien embedded inside of him and the alien talks to him, but nobody else can hear him. So they have this yin and yang, this sort of funny relationship and they love each other, but they're, the alien talks like this and I'm going to go eat people's heads and Tom, oh no, don't eat anyone's heads, blah, blah. Blah, blah. It's they have this sort of back and forth funny relationship, and then they go and fight crime together. And it's um, uh, it, the one thing that struck me is you know Tom Tom Hardy is about five feet tall. He's he's a very he's a pocket sized superstar, and so around him they had like four feet tall actors to make him look really big. And there's like an old saying in Hollywood that um short 
actors stand on apple boxes, but short stars have ditches dig dug around them for people to sit to stand in. Like the, the, if you're famous, they will dig a hole for the actor to stand in. But if you're not famous, you have to stand on an apple box yourself. So I have a feeling there's a ditch dug around him for every single scene because he's just wonderful. And they didn't do that when he was in Batman, when he played Bane. He was like just this little tiny, tiny, tiny little Bane. And Bane is supposed to be this huge. So it didn't work. He didn't work with DC, but he works with Marvel. It's so good. I really, really loved it. Have you seen it, Fenton? Do you know any I've of I've not seen it, but um, it's interesting. It's not part of the MCU, is it? It's actually produced mm -hmm. by Sony. Does it fit the MCU or is it well, like... It, you, they tell you to stay for past the credits because there's a little Easter egg afterward that you have to watch. And in that... Um, what happens in the comics is Venom was actually part of the Spider-Man universe, and he was a, the, the black um, uh, uniformed Spider-Man. And so it was an alien that came and took over Peter Parker. But so in this one, at the very end, you see uh, Peter Parker or Spider-Man come on the, the, the TV and he says, I know that guy or something like that. And then Doctor Strange is there. So I think they're tying him in right. at the end. I see. Oh, well, that's good. James, your depth of knowledge never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> I say that with no irony. But it is. Fenton, I think you will love it more than anyone else because you love Marvel. And this is, I, I think, one of the, my favorite Marvel. The characters are so funny. And it's like Deadpool where Ryan Reynolds was ad-libbing, you know. And this Tom Hardy is just sort of riffing with himself because he plays both the monster who talks like this. And he's also him. So he's sort of like just talking to himself back and forth. It's just I don't horrible. feel I know you anymore, James. So, you know, like you like the MCU. <laughs> you like, um, what else? Oh, Ryan, <laughs> everything, Ryan Murphy, you've come around. Yeah, it's true. I, I've been taken over by an alien who's inside, <laughs> yes, who's controlling exactly. me right <laughs> now. <laughs> he's just a moderate Republican now. He's just, he's just really <laughs> Number two. Number two. Aussie Media, uh, founded by Carlos Watson. Um, yeah, they, last Friday, they announced that they were closing. This is a, a big uh, production company that was doing um, new media as well as linear programming. Um, and it all came sort of unstuck. Um, Brad Bessie, who's a, a veteran producer and a good friend of ours, um, booked a talk show for them that was going to be on A&E. And then it showed up on YouTube. And it turned out there was no commitment to show the show on A&E. And Brad had booked all these amazing people using his connections on the show. So he resigned. That became a piece in the New York Times. And then there was another piece in the New York Times that on a call where they were going to raise money from Goldman Sachs, I think 40 million or something, um, it started off as a video conference call and someone from YouTube was going to join an executive, uh, Alex Piper, actually, from Unscripted in YouTube at YouTube, was going to join and vouch for how cool Ozzy was. But he wasn't on the line. And then... So they said, oh, he's having difficulty connecting. Let's switch to a phone call. So everybody hung up. They got on a phone call. And then suddenly, this guy from YouTube was there. Except he wasn't. It was one of the founders of Aussie Media impersonating the executive from YouTube. So unavoidably crooked and, and, and right. small and, and unforgivable. Right. That's like, yeah. Imagine... Yes, but just try to imagine. It's, well, imagine uh, you go to have a meeting with with Randy and Fenton, and it's it's me pretending to be Fenton. Is that sort of what happened? Hi, it's me, James St. James. <laughs> <laughs> James is having difficulty <laughs> connecting. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, they, but then you probably know this, but they he announced again that he's not closed for business. Right, the open for business. There's just no way, you know, we had an executive we liked very much who worked at World of Wonder who went over there. I felt bad for everybody. It was like real people that were involved and people from Discovery Channel. It was like a really interesting team. They had a really kind of pro-social, exciting kind of right. um, um, market employee. And the, 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 the guy who's in the big trouble who founded it is as a black man. So you hate this to happen to, you know, someone in, uh, of color in a, in, a, in a position of power, which has nothing to do with it, but it's still, it's, it's not what, you know, none of it's ideal. None of it's ideal. 
No, but as you're right, they closed down on Friday. And then over the weekend, uh, Carlos Watson said they're back open for business. And maybe there is a way back, you know? He said it's their Lazarus moment. So, you know, I, I hope whatever. Well, if, Katie Kirk, if Katie Kirk can continue to appear on television after that book, then Aussie Media is coming back strong. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, all right, let's take a break. Um, just before we go, I got to tell you, RuPaul's DragCon is back May 13th, 14th, 15th of 2022. Three full days. Get your tickets at RuPaul'sDragCon.com. All right. And that's happening in Los Angeles, California, Los Angeles it Convention is Center. It is the LA Convention Center. Yes, it's going to be bigger than better than ever. Um, yeah. Hey, let's take a break. Uh, when we come back, the number one thing this week that made us go wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hey, welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton Bailey, joined by James St. James. And uh, Tom Campbell and Blake. Um, number one, guys. Number one. I mentioned it before that 60 Minutes did two amazing stories. One of the uh, one was the Tony Bennett story, which was mu beautiful and moving. And this other one was infuriating and insightful because they had the Facebook whistleblower on whose name is a wonderful, smart woman named Frances Hagen, who's very reputable, who was brought into Facebook to help clean up all of the hate messaging and the misinformation that was like part literally why she was hired. And they disbanded her department. She took it upon herself to copy thousands of pages of documents and studies so she wouldn't be disputed that basically say, which isn't a surprise, but it's still horrible to see, that Facebook does little to nothing to stop spreading hate and misinformation on their site. Like three to 5% of that, those, that most messages worldwide are blocked. Um, and that means, I guess during the Trump election, the former election, the Trump-Biden election, they raised the bar a little bit. Remember we were seeing things like, this isn't true, that's not true. And when the election was over, it's like it all went away. And they Which just way? live in a culture, they live in a culture where it's about engagement, which leads to dollars over truth and facts because the you know people engage and i'll stop it. people engage when they're emotional and the easiest emotion to provoke on facebook is anger so divisive language gets everybody and us included guilty as charged uh into it Fenton. well that's what i just wanted to share about the guilty as charged because francis hagen was working at the civic integrity unit and i thought oh that rings a bell because facebook had a vice president of integrity and i sort of feel once you've got one of those you're in trouble but I was searching through my old Facebook posts, looking for the post, and I just noticed how angry everything I had posted was. These, these. I mean, I still hate Trump with a passion, but there was a lot of yes, James. Well, three points after this. The, the one of the other things that that was brought out during the the sixty minutes piece is the problem with Instagram and how Instagram is contributing to depression among teenagers, which leads to su many suicidal thoughts and everything Actually, like young that. Young female teenagers, young female teenagers, and there was like documented proof of that. She had document after document after document. What happened? After the 60 Minutes thing is what's fascinating to me, though, is because the next day, Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp go dark. And they don't go dark for 20 minutes. They go dark for hour after hour, which has never the happened. The longest six the hours of my life. It's what Two weeks of quarantine was nothing compared to that. Well, everybody who suddenly was found themselves on Twitter, which they hadn't been on in 20 years or whatever like that. Twitter had the best day in history. But... One of the some of the interesting uh, conspiracy theories that came out of this was is that um, uh, Facebook was having to testify before Congress this week. And so the theory was, is that Facebook shut themselves off and scrubbed their records before after the 60 minutes piece and before the congressional hearings. And it was all Zuckerberg who said, get that shit off the server now. And that's well, what they, people are saying it was. I'm, now the Q I'm sure they'll bounce back, but the, supposedly Mark Zuckerberg lost $7 billion on Monday. You know, he I'm didn't sure he'll really lose back. $7 billion though. Nobody really, when you're that rich, you really aren't losing $7 billion. It's all right. paper and theoretical. But the other Q and uh, what? The QAnon yeah. theory is that this was the beginning oh, of the. No, I've got to say it. I've got to do it. I've got. I'm Q. I'm Q all the way, baby. 
<laughs> I followed the QAnon people, and they thought that this was the beginning of the 10 days of darkness oh, that they've been God. talking about forever, in which everything is going down, everything will go down, and at the end of 10 days, Trump will rise like the Phoenix and take over and become president once again. So we have nine days until well, Trump rises. Well, it's so funny, James, because I, as I was going through my old Facebook things, I saw that actually, that, you know, Today, it's like, what, 25 days out from the election a year ago, and I was posting my that, that, that. But the interesting thing was, I thought that, um, they, that Facebook published a, um, a sort of memo in their defense sort of thing, an internal memo. And they're saying, well, you know, everyone has a rogue uncle or an old school classmate who holds strong or extreme views we disagree with. That's life. And the change meant that you are more likely to come across their posts. This is talking about when they tweaked their algorithm for meaningful social interactions. Anyway, then they say a couple of sentences later that in 2020, they removed 5 billion accounts from the platform. So it's like, hang on, that's a lot of rogue uncles. Like but, no, but, but 5 they, they, billion, but, no, 5, but the five billion, billion. The 5 billion were 4.9 billion of those were Russian bots. I mean, they I there's see. really no doubt about it. So they weren't really four, 5 billion angry uncles. <laughs> I'll end this on a personal note, which maybe I'll talk more about next week, which is I had this epiphany while being away and in the dark and sleeping is like, I feel like I succumbed to, before even this Facebook thing. It's just coincidental. It's like I, I succumbed to being riled up and to having hate in my heart for people that I know, for people that I love. And I am trying to take back. I feel like part of the, forgive me, the T word, the Trump agenda was to cause divisiveness mm. and hate among us and to take us away from people that we knew, that we grew up with, that we loved. And I'm, I, and I fell into that hole and my, um, and in the heat of the moment, I, I, you know, I just want to get back to like being more of a loving person and not judging people to their core because none of us can withstand that. Now, but I do want to say that that's all fine and dandy, but for the one hour of the week that we are all together, I want us to be as divisive and hateful as possible to keep the viewers coming and keep people listening. James St. James, mission accomplished. <laughs> Jay, this is this is the WoW report, James, not Squid Game. <laughs> <laughs> but if we all agree with each other and we all are happy, then no, there Tom, ain't no love show. you. Well, there's room I've for disagreement, but you know, you. there was this strikeness. I, I I look at people's face posts now, people I went to high school with, family, and I just don't think of them in that same. I don't have that same like Ugh, they're going to vote for Trump, but I just think like, oh my God, they posted pictures of their beautiful daughters. I'm going to like that. I'm just trying to like. Yeah normalize my relationships with people and still hold to truth to what I have, still speak my mind, but just not go to that place that social media lets you go, which is just too far for me. But I find that every time you go too far, there is a nice chimpanzee and duck that are hanging out together uh, that you just... Oh, uh, God, James, you're so right. I'm just, I've hit a seam of elephants. I just yes. love the elephants on Instagram. I, know, I, I want an elephant now. I love <laughs> puppies and kittens hanging out together. Yeah. That, to me, is my timeline cleanse. So I but guess maybe, you hate you know, cats. I, I what I'm hearing is that you hate cats. You guys are cat haters. What is this? I can't believe it. I hate you guys. The cats are the Republicans of the animal off. world. <laughs> They're the QAnons of the animal world. <laughs> Thanks for tuning into the Wow Report on Radio Andy Sirius XM. I'm sorry, that's all we got time for this week. But you can listen to previous episodes on our YouTube channel, Wow Presents. Same time, same place next week. And Until anyway. then, thank you for listening. And go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow.